Well, good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Grimm, and I'm here to talk about the real cabin fever, you know, the kind they had in the olden days versus what we have now, because now we have Netflix. <laughs> and they didn't then. So, a little backstory. Um, for some reason, when my family moved to Bridgeton in 1970, I became interested in Bridgeton history, and I've been interested ever since. So, that led to writing my first newspaper, um, my first term paper about this guy right here. This is Enoch Pearlie. Um, when I was in high school, and I've been writing about him ever since. He's, I say he's my stalker, like everywhere I go, <laughs> there he is. So that led me to some writing uh, a series of books called The Voices of Pondicherry. It started with this one right here, which is based on a diary of a young woman who grew up in South Bridgeton. She was actually a neighbor of mine 150 years apart. So uh, we have a lot in common. We'll talk about this one. This is, we're going to talk about this one in the third uh, class discussion, whatever we, we're calling this, um, and then the second one that came along that I wasn't expecting, it became a series, was this one called uh, Beneath Freedom's Wing, which is about the Underground Railroad and the abolition movement here in our local area. So that's next week, so that's next Thursday. But today we're going to talk about um, the background behind this one, it's called The Cabin in Glory. It's going to take me a little bit to get to the cabin, so I got to take you on a little bit of a history ride first. Buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> so it all started way back in 1690. Now I'm going to go back even farther than that. It all started in England. Okay, it was over there. A bunch of people decided they were going to come here. You've heard about the Pilgrims, right? Everybody knows about the Pilgrims. They came here. They got out on Plymouth Rock. They didn't really, but they got out on Plymouth Rock and then they made the thing and the stuff and all that happened. Well, once they got here and they kind of figured out that people could actually come here and not die, because there was kind of a mixed history with that. So once they figured that out, then that became um, a period of time that was known as the Great Migration. So there were a lot of people like clearing out of England and other places, but in New England, it was mostly from England. So they started coming here and colonizing Massachusetts. Um, there was the Massachusetts Bay Colony, where a lot of our ancestors are from, mine included, even though I'm from New Jersey. Strangely enough, it all ties back around. So they all came here and they, they started settling in the Salem area of Massachusetts. And then guess what? They started to spread. And do you know what it was that made them start to spread out? They needed land. So land in the traditional English way of passing down land was it went from father to the oldest son and everybody else was pretty much on their own. So they had to kind of make, a, make their own living. So you hear about second sons and seventh sons and they weren't the ones that got the money and the land. So they kind of had to start spreading out, trying to find more land. So they spread out into more um, slightly west of places like Salem. So they started to get into towns like Boxford, um, Andover. And our ancestors here in this part of the state, most of them came from that area, the Boxford and Andover area. So here's the way we all ended up here. Are you ready for this? Because this is long and convoluted. So King George II, rewarded some soldiers from this battle, this uh, campaign in 1690. And he said, yeah, I'll give you land for, in exchange for you having uh, helped me out. And the thing that they were helping the king out with was that um, the French slash Canadians were um, making some predations against the English and the, colon and the colonials. Uh, so they wanted to push the, the French back to Canada or beyond. You know, if you can get them completely off the continent, that would be great. <laughs> so they had some success and they had some terrible things that happened. And the king was going to reward them. Well, he wasn't going to reward them with money because <laughs> people don't really pay cash, do they? Uh, so he was going to reward them with land. And so what he did was he awarded them land in what was sort of Massachusetts, but really turned out to be New Hampshire. So the people in New Hampshire said, 
why are you giving away our land to people from Massachusetts? Why are you doing that? Come on in. <laughs> and we got more chairs if you need one. So we actually had people that went to this area of New Hampshire, settled, built their houses, farmed their land, and then we're told, oh, by the way, this is not Massachusetts, this is New Hampshire, so you're going to have to either pay us or, or leave. So that wasn't really like a really great way to get rewarded for your service or your father's service. <coughs> so it kind of died off a little bit until the grandchildren came around. The grandsons said, hey, here's a chance for us to get some land. So they uh, set up a committee, and that committee included a man named Moody Bridges. Anybody want to guess why Bridgeton is named Bridgeton? <laughs> hey, it's Moody Bridges. Um, so they set up this committee to petition the government, and the government said, yes, you can have some land up in that wilderness that we call the province of Maine. But here's the catch. You have to take that piece of property next to a, a settlement that's already in existence. So at that point, there weren't a lot of settlements in existence. There was Standish. So Bridgeton actually almost became um, what's now baldwin Sebago area. But they had another plan. Because there was this guy named Joseph Fry. Uh-huh. And he was pushing to get this uh, beautiful Saco River Valley land. So once he was successful in making that happen, and by the way, he was a family member of most of the people that we're going to talk about today. So there, there, as I've said before so many times, we are all cousins, and I think this guy right here is his own grandfather, <laughs> if you remember that song. Some of you youngsters might not, but you should look it up on YouTube. I am my own grandpa. Look it up. It's funny. <laughs> so anyway, they said, you can have this land, but it's got to be next to the settlement. So when Freiburg was settled, then the Bridgeton folks, although at that point it was called Pondicherry, said, okay, great, now we can get ours set up. And they had petitioned for a piece of land that was like seven miles by seven miles. Um, so then what they had to do was they had to set up a team of proprietors that was going to oversee how this land was distributed. And those proprietors were, guess who, Moody Bridges, and a guy named um, Milliken, Benjamin Milliken, who, by the way, went on to found the town of Ellsworth as well. After the revolution, he was known as Tory Ben, which, if you know your history at all, means that he sided with the British during the American Revolution. So he wasn't quite as popular after that. Um, and then the third member of the proprietors was a man named Thomas Purley. And Thomas Purley was the father of this guy right here. So Thomas Purley was a school teacher. And the three proprietors worked to start to put together a settlement. So the first thing they had to do was they had to send up a team of surveyors. So the surveyors came up Long Lake, and they went out into the woods, and they were out in the woods for, I don't remember. Do you remember how long they were out there? It was a few weeks, anyway. Yeah, I was going to say three, three, four weeks. Yeah, it was a while, because they had to survey the whole thing. Now, remember I said it was going to be seven by seven? Well, when they surveyed it, they might have made a couple of little miscalculations. So it actually ended up being like six and a half by nine miles, or something like that. But they were having a hard time getting a, a fix between the various lakes, and it was a whole thing. But they surveyed it. Step one, the proprietors have done their job. Now step two is, how are you going to make people move to this wilderness? Because if you think about it, there's no roads, there's no grocery store, there, there's nothing but wilderness. Wilderness and lakes and bugs, and that's it. So how do you make people want to come up here? So they had to put together a plan. And the first part of their plan was, we got to get somebody who's willing to come up here and build a store, be a presence here. So they got a, a guy by the name of Benjamin Kimball. And one of the things that he had to have was he had to have a good boat. Because the way that they were going to get people here and get their goods here was to come up the lake. So he had to have a boat. So 1768, we went from, you know, way back 
the, to the Pilgrim's time all the way up to 1768 now. That was a lot. So 1768, Benjamin Kimball comes up. And do you know how long ago 1768 was? It was 250 years ago this year. Party! <laughs> there are plans afoot just last night to actually throw a birthday party for Bridgeton this year. So stay tuned. I, I heard there's going to be a pontoon boat parade. I don't know. Carrie from Depot Street Tap House is on it. And whatever she comes up with is going to be fabulous. Uh, so 1768, Benjamin Kimball comes up here. And he builds a trading post, basically, in the wilderness. So that people have a place that they can come to. And they have a place where they can trade goods. Because there's really, there's not going to be any money here. There's not going to be any cash. So his job, <coughs> excuse me, is to come up here and he's sort of like the welcoming committee. He's the welcome, the welcome wagon from the olden days. So he comes up. And then the next thing they say, well, we've got to have somebody that can do some mill work. So whether it's going to be grinding grain or it's going to be a sawmill, we're going to need people that do this stuff. So then along comes a guy named Jacob Stevens. Stevens. Where have I heard that? Oh, Stevens Brook. Right. So he comes along. He starts with his mill. And then that opens the door to other people starting to come up here, which brings us to 1773, and guess who shows up? Enoch Pearlie, my stalker. So he turns up, um, and we know that he's here at that point in time because we have letters that he's sent from here back home to Boxford. So Enoch comes up here because the proprietors, one of whom is Enoch's dad, need somebody to keep track of the records. So they needed somebody who was educated, could read and write, uh, and was going to be careful about taking care of things. So they sent Enoch, and he was about 25 years old. Now, I didn't know until just a couple of years ago when I was doing research that his profession was actually that of housewright. So he was a house builder. And you really want a guy like that to be up here when you have no house to live in, right? You want him to be one of the guys that shows up. So we have this really great amount of information about Enoch Pearlie, about his family, about the early days of Richardson's history and Harrison's history and Naples' history because they all kind of spun off from there because the Pearlies were great letter writers. So at the Bridgeton Historical Society, we have a set of letters from Enoch Pearlie's brother Thomas to Enoch Pearlie here in Bridgeton. Well, I went down to do some research at the Peabody Essex Museum, way back home in, Salem, in the Salem Peabody area, and I found the letters that are the other side of the letters that we have. And the reason that I realized that they were the same letters, the same sequence of letters, is because I was reading in Bridgeton about this, I can't remember if it was a copper pot or a brass pot, but Enoch Pearlie was trying to get his brother to come up with a pot and it had to be certain size and you know we wanted it to be affordable of course and so I'm sitting in the the Peabody Essex library and I'm reading about Enid Pearlie asking his brother to get this pot and it's got to be this and it's got to be that I was like wait a minute so that's a really an interesting thing that to have somebody who's not like a big famous guy to have a complete series of letters like that I mean if you're corresponding with I don't know, Taylor Swift or something. She's like a hip person now for you older folks, apparently. I don't know. Is she still hip? Taylor Swift? You don't know. <laughs> yeah, she is, sure. Okay, great. I, the Taylor Swift fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five-year-old guy says. <laughs> She's at least somebody I've heard of, okay, who's young. So if it was somebody famous that you were corresponding with, you were corresponding with George Washington, for example, you, you would probably want to hold on to those letters, and of course, because he was famous, his letters would still be in existence. But for somebody that's not like a big, important guy, to have that complete correspondence is really great. Now, his family, as I said, was big letter writers. So we have a lot of details about how their life was, what they did, um, where they were here and there, the land records. That we have so much information. And it's a treasure trove for this area, because we have so much, so much local history that's been preserved. 
So, <clears throat> Enoch was here in 1773, and he's writing a letter back home, and he's saying, I'm going to try to be home by Christmas, but before I go home, I've got to shoot a moose. <laughs> because his concern was that the people who were here would starve that winter if they didn't have meat laid up. So he was already being a provider um, and a neighbor and doing those sort of um, civic good things to help his neighbors out. And that's one of the hallmarks of that period in history, and I'd like to see it come back more and more now. Uh, people looked out for each other, and it's really important. It's important that you have somebody that you can call and say, hey, I just got stuck in the driveway, can you come give me a push? Great, my battery died, can you come help me? Um, my leg's broken, can you give me a ride to the hospital? Little things like that are kind of important. So he was already being a good neighbor and building a community here. The next time we see Enoch Pearly in um, Bridgeton, slash, it was still Pondicherry, and then it was Bridges Town, and then it was Bridgetown, and then it was Bridgeton. Um, the next time we see him, though, is after a certain event happens. Anybody remember what happened in the 1770s in this country? There was like a, I don't know, war or something? I don't know. Something about now we hated the British? I don't know. Well, Enoch Curley went back to Boxford, and this community kind of settled in a little bit because of not a lot of growth was going on at that point because they were a little busy down Massachusetts way um, trying to figure out this whole relationship with the British. So Enoch Curley actually um, ends up in the army, and he marches from Boxford in 1775 with the rest of the militia from Boxford. And they're heading for a special little place called Lexington Concord. Have you heard of that place? Something, something important happened there, like a shot that was heard around the world. I don't know. I can't remember. Wait, yes, I can. So Enoch goes out with the militia, and he's out for six days, and he marches, like, I don't know, a long, long way. And pretty much decides that's not, <laughs> not really where he wants to be. So he ends up coming back to Boxford, and he and his family, the proprietors, they're all working towards that change over to Bridgeton, so moving up to Bridgeton. So he comes back up, 1776, after he's done with his six-day um, army tour. <laughs> and he's living up here, and he's clearing his land. So this is the part where we start to talk about what it was like, like what it was really like to live in this area back in those days. So he's living probably in a lean-to, and he's trying to clear his land. And there are letters where he's talking about that. And the way that they cleared their land was they would um, make a strip around a tree so that it would die off. And then once it died off, it was easier to fell it. And of course, they're going to use the wood for a variety of things. So he's building a house for Jacob Stevens, while another man named Billy Emerson is working on the trees on his property. So they're swapping. And there was a great deal of swapping, bartering back in those days because there just wasn't any cash. So they would swap, you know, a day's labor for the use of a cow, for example. They rented out cows. It's, it's fascinating, but they rented out cows. And I'm just fascinated by that every time I run across it. So then Enoch Purley builds a cabin. And this is it right here. And this is when I talk about the cabin in glory. This is his cabin. So I want to um, bring your attention to the soap dispenser on the sink. And then over here, there's a little piece of blue tape. And then back there near that, um, I think right, right about where that yellow bookshelf is, and across from there, that was the size of Enoch Pearlie's cabin. So you're all sitting, and some of your, some of, we've got cabin overflow on the back there. So this was the size of the cabin that Enoch Curley lived in his first winter here. Only he wasn't alone. He had his pregnant wife, and he had a slave girl with him. A slave girl in Bridgeton, say it isn't so. So this cabin, 18 by 18, Here's a door, there's a window on each side. Up here there's a window, and this was a loft. And this is where the young slave girl slept. 
So she was up here, and then they lived, there was a bed, there was a cupboard, there was a fireplace, and that was pretty much it. And they're all crammed into that 18 by 18 cabin through that long, long winter with her being pregnant, and then giving birth in January. So then you've got a newborn on top of all of that. Now this cabin, anybody know where it is now? Bridgeton. It's in Bridgeton. <laughs> it is in Bridgeton. So I don't know if you're familiar with South Bridgeton, where the apple orchard is, um, Tom Geiger's apple orchard on 107. That's where Enoch Pearlie's house was. That's where this cabin was. He's built, he built two other houses after that. One of them burned down. Um, and the third one is still there. So when you visit the apple orchard to pick your apples, that's Enoch Pearlie's land that you're on. But this cabin is no longer there because it was moved, and it was moved down on a peninsula on Highland Lake. So if you know where Highland Lake Beach is, and then there's a dentist office coming back towards Harrison, and then kind of sitting out on this little peninsula, there's this old log cabin. Probably most people don't even notice it. But that's Enoch Pearlie's cabin. It's been added on to. So now um, off the back, there is a kitchen area that was added on. And then off the front, there is a porch that looks out over the, over the uh, Highland Lake. It's a very nice spot. It's very lovely. We did, um, with the Rufus Porter Museum, we did a uh, mystery history tour at, I can talk about it now, right? Oh, yeah. It's over. Oh, yeah. So we did a mystery history tour, and that was one of the places. And Margaret and I were hanging out there. It's very nice, right there on the, on the beach. Uh, not on the beach, but right there on the, um, on the lake. So this door is gone, um, and then there's new windows put across on both sides, and then the porch on the front has some French doors that go in. But within this house, there are still the beams that Enoch Pearlie cut by hand, and there are little bits and pieces. There are little door latches and things like that that were hand carved that are still original. The fireplace is gone probably reused on the Geiger's, what's now the Geiger's farm, for something else. But a new fireplace was put in. So it's been sitting there since 1960-something? I can't remember. I should know that. I was the docent that day. But um, I have a few details in my head. So it's still in existence, and it's um, this little piece of Bridgeton history that's been lovingly preserved by the family. It's been passed down from generation to generation. Um, and the current owners have been so gracious about letting us historic weirdos come in there. And, <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, Enoch Burley must have done that himself. So this um, little space that they were living in, as you can imagine, was pretty tight. Now, this was tiny house before tiny house was cool, right? The tiny house thing has come back around again. And what people are realizing is you don't need a 2,500 or 3,000 foot or bigger house to live in. You can get by on a lot smaller. And people are starting to kind of contract back towards that, which is fascinating to me. So this house right here, when he built his new house, he actually moved this uh, back and used it as a tool shed. And that's one of the, there's some scenes in the book that take place in the, in the little old house. Um, and there's another one that I'm writing in the book that I'm working on now, which is the fourth book in that series. And uh, it involves that little house and some interesting activities that went on there. Um, just a couple of other little things here. This is a bear trap. I don't know if you're familiar with a bear trap road in South Bridgeton. It's called the Bear Trap Road because this is up at the top of it. So this is a granite bear trap that was built by Enoch Pearlie and his, probably his hired men, maybe his neighbors. And it was for trapping bears. And apparently it was pretty successful. Um, it's still there. It's been you know, shifted a little bit because the ground shifts and who knows who's been up there. Uh, but it's still there. It's still there and it's really it's a great little um, artifact to have. And then this is a picture of the Pearly Memorial gravestone thing at the little um, graveyard that's on the, um, the apple orchard property. Yes, sir? How does the bear trap work? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an excellent question. <coughs> so there was a, like a, a 
kind of a gate thing that opens up and then the bear goes in and he trips it and then the, the gate shuts. So it's like a metal grate. And then how do you get the bear out? That's the question. <laughs> What do you think? Uh, you shoot it. Yeah, I'm guessing that's probably what <laughs> They probably didn't open it and go, come on out, the yeah. bear, come on. <laughs> um, there was a, also a steel bear trap that Enoch was using before then. That's another, uh, Martha, Margaret and I were talking about um, some pearly artifacts that were wondering where they are. There was a steel bear trap that was with the pearly cradle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm. So there's, somewhere out there, there's a steel bear trap that has ties to Bridgeton. We don't know where it went to. Um, but this is in the, the little graveyard that's on the uh, Geiger's property, and you can stop in and visit anytime you want. I'm, I'm there all the time seeing the folks. But this is, um, this is what I want to talk about next. On this uh, grave monument, there's a little line down here, and it says, Chloe Purley, a woman of color who lived with the Purley family until her death, and she was, oh, 62 years old when she died in 1828. Well, you know, I knew this was there. And I visited the, the graveyard, and I've seen it, and I knew it was there. But I never did the math. And here's why the math is important. I'm also an accountant, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of into math. I'm all mathy and stuff. I did the math, and I realized that when Anna and Chloe came here to live with Enoch in the little house, she was about 10 years old. So I always thought of her as, like, a colored woman who lived with... She was a kid. She was a kid. And she was... Um, before she came to Maine, slash Massachusetts, she lived in Salem with Anna Purley's family. And she was there long enough to learn to speak English, to learn how to read and write, and to learn all of the household tasks that she would need to learn. So what? how old was she when she came from Africa? Maybe eight, seven, six? Yes, sir. I'm confused. You said there, um, when they were living in that cabin, there was a pregnant woman, and I at first thought it was the slave girl. Was I incorrect? No. The slave girl was not pregnant. No, it was okay. Enoch Curley's wife okay. was pregnant. Well, so Chloe came up here as a servant. She was a slave at that time, but she was a servant for Anna Curley. She was actually purchased on the docks of Salem from a slave ship. And she was purchased to be a dowry for Deacon Flint's daughters. So supposedly there were four slave girls purchased they, um, as dowry. I've only ever found one daughter, or one or two daughters, I think, for um, Deacon Flint. So I'm not sure whether he bought them also for his daughters-in-law or what the, the deal was. But yeah, she was, so she was purchased off the dock. And then uh, lived with the, the uh, Flints, who were uh, very progressive for that point in time, because they wanted to make sure that these girls learn how to read and write, that they could function in our society. So Chloe comes up here, and she's living up in her little, her little room up here, the room with the view. And she's um, very much a part of the family. And it's strange to me, because if you think about what was going on at that point in time with other slaves, you know, they weren't generally going to be treated as part of the family. I mean, they were family, but they were, you know, that family, sort of an extension of kind of our family. But Chloe was living in the house with them, and when Enoch Curley talks about her in his letters, he always refers to her as part of the family. There's no distinction. He says, the family are all well, except Chloe's got a cold, and, you know, little John is teething or whatever. So he's very inclusive of her. So if you're, you know, somebody who likes a mystery, which, you know, I kind of am, when you start thinking about, oh, gosh, there was this little kid in Bridgeton who was from Africa. Mm. You want to know more about her. So I started doing a lot of digging. There's a book that was written by one of the Pearly descendants named um, Elizabeth Shepley Sargent. And she wrote a book 
based on family stories and family letters. <coughs> and one of the things that she talks about in this book is this character, Chloe. And there's all these little clues. So we know that Chloe was a West Guinea slave, so she came from the west coast of Africa in a very small area. It was, a, well, it's a fairly large area. So we, we know where she's from in Africa in general. And then there are all these little clues in Elizabeth Shepley's book. Uh, Chloe tells a story about having seen elephants in the jungle. Oh, so that part of Africa, there's only certain areas where there's jungle where there would be elephants. She also talks about um, a crocodile because she has, she wears a medicine bag, what, what Native Americans would call a medicine bag. So in that medicine bag, she keeps her conjure bones, right? So she's got chicken bones, and when she wants an answer to something, she'll go up here to the old cabin, and she throws her bones. Interesting character, this Chloe, here in Bridgeton, Maine. Um, and then also, in that bag is allegedly crocodile scales. Crocodile scales in Bridgeton? What? <clears throat> so that's another clue. <coughs> but the best clue of all is that the Pearlie family has recorded the lullabies that she sang to the Pearlie children. So I took those lullabies, as they were recorded in the book, and I guess what I did? I did a Google search. And guess what came up? What came up? There is a book that someone wrote about the songs of Western Africa. And yes, those words were actually in this book. So the translation was true to what the early uh, person had recorded, and it's very specific to a certain area of Africa. And I thought, well, there's my Alex Haley Roots moment, for those of you who remember Alex Haley and Roots. I found you, you old African. It was one of those moments. <clears throat> so Chloe, for me, is like, she's like this mysterious person. And um, Ian Pearlie's daughter, Nancy, talks about her like, uh, it, it's kind of degrading and demeaning in a little bit of a way, but it's for that time, you know, it's how they approach things. So when she's describing Chloe, it's always like, oh, this dusky queen of the jungle kind of thing. It's like a lot. It's a little over the top. A lot over the top. And she talks about how she's wearing uh, gold hoop earrings, and she's got a turban, um, and her voice is the, you know, the dusky voice of a jungle princess. And but you really, you start to get a good glimpse of who she is as a person. And then um, Nancy Pearlie will kind of say something like, oh, Chloe's acting white now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she definitely kept her, her African heritage very close to her because she kept her medicine bag and she was throwing her conjure bones and but she also had like this kind of overlay of a you know good Puritan housewife kind of person. And so that's when Nancy Pearlie refers to her as acting white, is she's kind of trying to figure out who Chloe is. And, and Chloe is both of those people. She is that um, mystic uh, person who has kept her um, African religion and culture, as well as she's embraced the Puritan culture as well. It's, it's an interesting mix, and I love her. Now, with Chloe, it's, there's some sadness there. First of all, you know, she's taken from her family and taken so far away that she'll never see them or have any, any contact with them. And she actually comes out of it better than some people who did, who had that experience. She actually lands in a family where she's cared about and uh, looked after and becomes part of the family. So she's actually a little better off than a lot of people are in that situation. But there is one thing, and I keep coming back to this, she could never marry. Because the only black person in this area was this slave named Limbo who lived in Freiburg. 
and she couldn't marry him because he couldn't read and write, and she just would not marry somebody who was ignorant. So he was her one choice, um, and I, I, I bring that into the book here and there because here she is caring for the pearly children as they're born, and she'll never have her own. And so part of what she talks about in her songs is, I have not my own. So it's kind of an interesting and sad thing. Yes, sir? Um, you said that Chloe threw her bones on the floor for answers. Why did she do that? Yeah, it's, um, it's an African tradition and also some other um, cultures where it's like, have you heard about people doing fortune telling? It's like that. So if the bones fall a certain way, it means it's one answer. And if they fall a different way, it means it's a different answer. And it's the, they're interpreting that, whether it's, you know, who knows. I don't want to say it's not real, but because I don't want somebody to put a hex on me. <laughs> but it's, it's similar to, have you ever seen anybody use a Ouija board? Where they put their hands on it and they're like, ask it a question. And it says, you know, do you like Sally Jane? Yes! Oh, you like Sally Jane? So it's that same kind of thing. It's that trying to cross over into the spirit world in a way. So when she wanted an answer to something, she would go up there and she would throw the conjure bones. And usually they were like chicken bones or something like that, depending on where you lived. But I think hers were chicken bones, because I think they mentioned that in the book. So it's a way of trying to get an answer when you're confused about something. Some people would say a prayer. She threw her conjure, conjure bones and then probably said a prayer, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Did you say how many children the Pearlies had? The Pearlies had five <coughs> children. Um, the oldest two, the boys, um, John and Thomas. Uh, John inherited the family homestead. And then Thomas, as the second son, was given some land in Naples. So if you know where the Pearly Road is off of 302, mm -hmm. that's where um, Thomas's house is. And it's still there. It's a gorgeous house. And then um, the daughters, as they called themselves, the disinherited, <laughs> because they were not, they would never um, inherit any land, because you know they're women. Um, so they got household goods when they got married. So that was their dowry was that they got you know a bedstead and they got um, uh, Rebecca Pearlie, the oldest daughter, tells a story of being given um, a cartload of turnips and she sort of looks as, upon that as part of her inheritance uh, and she tells a story of she's coming from um, if you're familiar with South Bridgeton Route 107 going out to um, the, the Geiger's orchard as you're coming back from that it's mostly downhill you know I used to ride my bike and it was uphill both ways back then but those days it was downhill um, so she's coming down uh, the hill near Adams Pond and she's having a problem with her wagon. There's a, there's a board loose. So the board bumps up and the turnips, she's leaving a trail of turnips all the way down the road. And she had to go back and pick up as many as she could because, you know, it's her inheritance. You know, I just <laughs> drop your turnips all over the road. Uh, so Rebecca Pearlie married Ebenezer Fessenden and they lived in Freiburg. Now, Freiburg at that point was the up-and-coming town, and Enoch Pearly was rather upset about that because his daughters were deserting him, and he wanted them close by. Uh, he was a very, very much a family man, and from his letters and um, the stories told about him, um, he wanted his family close by. He was very much a, a good father, a caring father, um, but he, he liked to tell these stories about how, you know, when they first came up here, he had to sleep with his gun next to his bed because of the wildlife and you know they didn't have a pot and they had to go uphill both ways and you know the snow was up to here he used to tell those same kinds of stories to his kids and they were like oh gosh here goes dad again um, so Rebecca married Ebenezer Fessenden and they lived in Freiburg and then um, the next daughter Rebecca ended up marrying um, also a Freiburg man and moving to Freiburg. She married a doctor named Rule Barrows. And then their daughter, Hulda, well, the bones fell the wrong way. <laughs> and um, yeah, Hulda didn't make it. So anyway, um, and I wanted to touch on 
a couple of the things, a couple of the areas. Yes, sir. Did you figure out approximately which country in West Africa? I did. I actually came down to a tribe. Wow. Which and one? it's the Kissy tribe. It's K I S S E E. And they're where? They're in. Um, mm -hmm. There's like this little tiny area, um, and I'm trying to remember which country it's in now, and I, yeah, it's yeah. not coming to. I'm not. I, it's not coming to me which country it is, but it's kind. Of, it's not on the coast. Um, it's inland somewhat. Amala. Uh, I don't remember. I, I probably knew at the time I looked it up. I probably knew what it was then. Was it turned in a Muslim artifact? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I don't know, but it could be. Could be. Um, if you look up the Kissy tribe, you can pinpoint where it is. I'm sorry, I don't remember. K I S S E E. Yeah, Kenya. and it's Kenya. Uh, Kenya. Oh, way over there. It's in Kenya. <laughs> but it's kind of on the on the western side of that. So there's like a little a little area that's kind of in the middle of where that tribe is. It kind of straddles an area. The main chicane. Well, that's that's East Africa. Yeah. This yeah, you got to go go this way, go this way, because <laughs> the the tribe the um, the tribe came from a very very specific place, um, and it was on the west the western side of, but not all the way to the coast. Was she Banshee? I, I think she was. That's my thought. And I actually started looking up people from that area and what they looked like so I could get an idea. Like, I don't know. She's just fascinating to me. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what life was like outside of that little cabin. So I'll start with church, because church was very much a part of how people lived and how they did things. So one of the, uh, one of the things that um, the early settlers had to do was they had to hire a minister. And they had to have, have a place for the minister to preach, and they had to support the minister. So the first settled minister in Bridgeton was Nathan Church. And if any of you watched uh, or saw the Rufus Porter house moving, um, November of when was that? 2016, when, when the, the house was moved from up on North High Street down to next to the Bridgeton Library. Um, there's a great video of it, by the way. It was done by Mike Corthell. <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, that house is Nathan Church's house. So it's a very special house. Um, it has Rufus Porter slash Jonathan Poor murals in it. Um, but my interest is from the people side of it uh, for the purposes of today, because he was an important person in the community. But this is what Sunday was like for the forebears. They'd get up very early, and Enoch Pearley and his family traveling in from South Bridgeton, they'd come by wagon or horseback or both. So they'd get here for the morning service. The morning service would go on forever. Um, you know, the, the pastor's sermon would be like eight tiny handwritten pages. and The handwriting was tiny, the pages were not. So he would go on and on and on and on and on. And then they would break for lunch. And then he, they'd come back and he would preach another whole sermon. So he's a hardworking guy to come up with two complete sermons every single Sunday is a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So it would last for a very long time. Now in the meantime, they got to get back because they got to do what? They got to milk the cows, feed the chickens, walk uphill both ways. It's a whole thing. But church was very much a part of their lives and very much a part of the structure of society. There were rules, and you followed them. And one of those rules was you will be in church, or you better have a good reason. Um, so church was very much a part of their lives, but it was also not just the religious part of it, it was the social part of it. Because remember, you know, they're all in their little cabins and they only ever see each other most of the week. So you gotta get out a little bit. That's why we're doing the series here. This is the, we all need to get out of the house now and then series. <laughs> you start shooting holes in the door and things like that, it's not good. So it was very much a social thing. It was a chance for the young people to get together and start picking out their spouses 
They might not have called it that, but that's basically what was going on. You know, that's where you went to meet people. You didn't meet them on the internet, you know, you didn't run into them. You know, it was always going to be at church or school that you met them. It was always somebody in the neighborhood. Now, the government side of things, um, let me see if this sounds familiar to any of you who follow town government. Once a year, they'd have a town meeting, and they'd all get together, and they'd stand up, and they'd, you know, well, I think we ought to be doing this. Uh, and then they would vote on stuff, and they'd pay the town bills, and then um, that was pretty much the same as it is now. <laughs> Nothing has changed on that front. I mean, the building is a little nicer and bigger, but other than that, pretty much the same. Uh, libraries came along pretty early. A lot of churches had their own library. Uh, so the congregational churches in Bridgeton started their own libraries because it was very important to them that everybody was educated. They had an extremely low rate of illiteracy, people that couldn't read. Extremely low. Like, almost everybody could read and write. That's phenomenal. We don't have that now, but we should. I recommend it. Um, so education was very, very important. One of the things that... Um, Freiburg had that Bridgeton didn't have was they had an academy so their young people could go there and get educated. So Bridgeton, um, part of what I'm writing about right now in the, in the fourth book of the series is uh, the founding of Bridgeton Academy because the way that it worked, three sections of the town went out and they were like, we got to get the academy here. We want the academy here. So they went out and they were collecting money. So they were getting pledges and subscriptions that, you know, if the, the academy is built here in South Bridgeton, then we're all going to give this money. If it's built here in the center of Bridgeton, we'll give this money. Well, guess who won? North Bridgeton won. So um, it actually came down to a point where they each raised the same amount of money, about pretty close. They each raised about four to $5,000. And so it came down to location, location, location. And the, the independent trustee people that came in and looked around, they were like, okay, so we got this really great lake right here, so that's how it ended up there. So they were very much looking at what do we do next, what do we do next, what do we do next. So we had libraries, we had schools, we had churches. Schools were usually what, what you would think of now as like the one-room schoolhouse. That's generally what was happening. But the... Uh, the school system progressed very quickly because <clears throat> families had tons of kids. So there was one family, like there were 17, I think, it was, I think it was the Ingalls family, I think they had like 17 children named Ingalls in the, in the one room schoolhouse. Uh, so as the schools grew, more settlers came in, people had more children, then they would add another school district, and then they add another school district, and then eventually, what did they do? They all brought them all together. And I'm not sure the education got better. Just an opinion. So all of the facets of life, the social stuff, the church, the uh, schools, the libraries, all of those things were put in place a very long time ago. And they're still here and still thriving. So it's, it's a pretty fantastic thing to be able to sort of tie back to that and to understand that those people who came up here to the wilderness and they worked so hard to get all this stuff in place, it's still here. So their lasting legacy is just that. They built a town, and we all get to live within the framework of that and enjoy their labors while we do our own labors that will lead to um, whatever we're doing for the next generation. So, yes, sir? You might want to mention that uh, back in the early time that Richard extended over here to Keith yes. Falls Road. So this was all part of Bridgeton. Yes, that, uh, thank you. Um, so part of what was going on with the surveying is because of the way the surveyors did the original survey, they ended up with all this land on kind of this side of the lake that they hadn't actually originally intended. So this didn't get surveyed right away. They worked on um, assigning the lots and uh, selling the land on the other side. And then this eventually did get surveyed. And it was actually Benjamin Kimball Jr. who did the surveying over here. And then that broke off um, to Harrison, and then you've got um, the Otisfield side of things, and then part of Bridgeton broke off to be Naples, which is how um, 
Thomas Pearley ended up in Naples rather than in Bridgeton, even though you can almost see their houses from, uh, from the hill up there at uh, Geiger's Farm. So there was a lot of boundary stuff that was going on, and it was, um, they were constantly carving things off. So they carved off some from, there was something that was carved off another town that ended up as Bridgeton. There was a lot of that going on. So that's how Harrison came to be. It was kind of carved off from pieces of um, the Bridgeton grant, and I think, I think another grant, I think, was part of that. I know Otis Field and, and Harrison are kind of side by each and part of the whole picture, um, but some of it was Bridgeton, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Someone had mentioned that, uh, or, or why is Harrison called Harrison? Harrison is called Harrison because of Mr. Otis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, didn't he have a brother, Harrison? So it was his, I think it was his son. So Mr. Otis's son, I think, was Harrison, and that's how we ended up with Harrison. But somebody might want to Google that. Harrison, Harrison Otis. Harrison Otis. Yeah. So was he the Otis Field guy, or was he the son of the Otis Field guy? It's, if, if you're members of the Harrison Historical Society, it's in their newsletter This that I just got yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> So yeah, so Harrison and, and Otis, I think it was the same person. They might have been brothers. I don't know. I can't remember. But it's in the newsletter, so <laughs> I'm going to go check that. So how big is Bridgeton today? Uh, uh, I just actually saw that this morning. It's like 37,000 square feet or something. I don't know. I can't remember the number, but it's... Um, it's bigger and smaller than it originally was, both. <laughs> so, the boundaries have all moved. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Who else of the young people here have a question? What do you want to know about? Would you like to know about bathroom things? Because, you know, they had outhouses. Privies. <laughs> <laughs> they had privies, yes. Yes, ma'am. When did Helda die? Um, Halda died in 1819 of some sort of fever kind of thing. So she got very, very sick. And she was, here's, a, here's some scandal for you, okay? So Halda was actually engaged to Dr. Rule Barrows. But Halda's sister Nancy kind of had a crush on him. So after Halda died, Nancy married her boyfriend. <laughs> What do you think of that? It's not like you had a lot of options. Right? <laughs> 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 it's like wasting a person who's a good doctor. Exactly. Right. You know, somebody's got to marry the doctor. So, um, but yes, uh, when she was very sick, that's when <coughs> Chloe went up here to her old room, and she threw the bones, and the bones fell the wrong way, and so she knew. Oh, I just got goosebumps. Well, that was weird. So she knew that Holda was going to die, and she was right. Mm -hmm. But that's, a, that's an excellent point, actually. I wanted to talk about the health of the people back in the day. It wasn't good. So one of the things that happened, and there was actually a, a letter from Enoch Pearlie, a couple letters from Enoch Pearlie, where in the space of a month, a month or six weeks, his family has, some of them have the measles, some of them have the chicken pox, and some of them have the cow pox. They didn't have months. I don't know how they escaped that, but I mean, they pretty much hit them all. But it was a very short period of time. Some of them got the measles, some didn't. Some got the cowpox, and some didn't. And I think they all got the chicken pox, or maybe, I can't remember. Anyway, they were sick a lot. So there were things like that that were very contagious. And then there were things like typhoid and typhus fever. And then there was the dreaded consumption. Mm, which is, we call it tuberculosis now, so it's like a, a major lung dysfunction thing. Um, and people would waste away for years. It was horrible. Yes, ma'am? What's the cowpox? Um, it's related. See, I had to look this up on Google. So it's related to the chicken pox, but you actually caught it from cows. So like when you're milking the cow and the cow had sores, they were contagious, so you could catch the cowpox and it would kind of go up all your arms and big blistery kind of. And then they're renting the cow out. And then they're renting the cow out. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So the other thing that was an absolutely heartbreaking disease at that point in time was diphtheria. Yeah. And the Peabody family, who was um, this Enoch Perley's sister Mary, married Lieutenant John Peabody, and they lived next door almost. Um, they lost four of their children within six weeks of the diphtheria. And it was a, a dreaded, dreaded disease because it, it literally, it, it always, almost always um, was caught by children. And then it would just strangle them. And it was absolutely horrible. So you can imagine like coming down to the gross, to the breakfast table and you know, four of your kids are no longer there. Really heartbreaking stuff. So we're very lucky now that we have medicine that either prevents or um, cures some of these diseases. You know, tuberculosis was just terrible. And it's easily cured now. But we didn't have those antibiotics back then. So that was... Um, Nathan Church's family, the first minister I mentioned, um, three of his daughters died of consumption because they just, there was no cure and they just wasted away and it's a horrible way to die. I don't want to go into the details, but there's a lot of coughing. Um, so there were doctors in the area, but you know, they, they were only as good as the information that they had at the time. So Dr. Farnsworth uh, was our first doctor and then his son was also a doctor, and then we had the Fessenden doctors. And uh, so we had doctors, but there wasn't, you know, they could only do what they could do. And it wasn't much. They, they did weird things too, like bleeding people. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't feel good? Here, let me get take some blood from your arm. <laughs> really? <laughs> I feel so much better now. <laughs> All right, so who else has questions out there? Yes, ma'am. Um, when you were researching, did you run across anything about um, Stephen Gates, who accompanied Captain Kimball? Yes. I don't know a lot about him, but I have come across him here and there. Um, is he a relative? Well, well, it was very odd because I'm from Kentucky, <laughs> so you would think I would have absolutely no connection to Maine, but when I was doing some of my genealogy, I discovered that my fourth great-grandfather's sister, Anna, married Stephen Gates' son, Nathaniel, when Nathaniel and a bunch of the brothers here from Pondicherry went to Ohio. Yeah, <laughs> and that was, a, that was a really common thing. Um, we had a a really bad winter one year. You may have heard about it. It's called um, 1800 and froze to death, or the year without a summer. Right. right. So 1819. Um, I've been wanting to write about this like my whole life. I just think this is so fascinating. You know, it was snowing in the in the middle of the summer, like a lot of snow, not just like a little spit like we had today. It was a lot of snow, and. Um, the crops failed like crazy. Um, there were major, major weather, weird stuff going on. And so people got together, and sometimes whole towns left the state, and they went out to Ohio or various places. And we saw the same thing, not we, because I wasn't here, but I feel like I was, um, after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Once our main men had gone out there, and they had gotten, uh, they've seen, <laughs> they saw fields that didn't have rocks. Yeah, you know? right. come on, that was like really big. You see all the stone walls that we have around here? It's because we've got to get the rocks out of the way. It also helped to keep cattle in and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we had to have a place to put the rocks because we had to get them out of the way so we could plow the, the land. So people were looking for opportunity. And opportunity was any place that you were, right? The same thing now. Uh, when I was graduating from high school, I had a lot of friends who were like, I'm out of here, I'm going to California, I'm going to Florida. Um, it's going to be better wherever you're going to go. Mm -hmm. And that's so they were looking for basically, you know, a better life, just like everybody who, who moves anywhere. Um, so there was a lot of migration at that point. And some of my New Jersey people left New Jersey and went out to, I think it was Illinois, and there's a town out there called Jersey or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they went there, they kind of took what they had, and they did the same thing when they came here from England. Like they left England, they came here, and then they tried to create exactly what they had left behind in England. <laughs> but but it was better because it was here. Um, but yeah, people do that all the time. You know, it's like uh, 
I, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. But people come up here from New York, you know, to get away from it all, and then they're like, well, you know, you should do it this way. <laughs> like we do back in New York, you know? There are those people. So migration was amazing to me, and the, the amount that they traveled to was really interesting to me. And one of the things that they talk about in their letters is whether it was good slaying or not. Because in the wintertime, if it was good sleighing, they could travel back to Boxford or Andover or wherever they were from to see their families and get some business done and that kind of thing. If it was bad sleighing, they were kind of trapped in their little cabin. <laughs> Nowhere to go. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I find over and over again in studying history, whether it's local history or you know another country, wherever, is people are people. Yeah, mm -hmm. people are the same wherever you go. Um, there's always going to be troublemakers, and there's always going to be people that are doers and movers and shakers, and people who sit back and say, "Well, somebody ought to do something about." Mm. Um, so people are people, and it's fun to study them and um, to find those cranky people. You know, in, in the pages of history is always fun for me. Um, and then to find the interesting people like my friend Chloe. I saw a hand. Yeah, I was just wondering how far or how long it would take them to get from Bridgeton to Freiburg if they were going. What would that commute it would look like? Well, <laughs> you know that nice 302 row that we have now right, that's been yeah. paved? They didn't have that. Yeah. So yeah. to make a trip like that, I mean the roads were absolutely horrible. You were, like It might be like a little path through the woods. You know? So it took a while um, until they got to a point where they could actually get a carriage through and then still, you've got, you know, you just look at any road in the spring here uh, and imagine like 10 times worse than that because they didn't have like, you know, pavement over it. So every tree root, every, you know, stone in the way, boom, boom, boom. Exactly, yeah. By the time you get there, you're like, wow, my kidneys are shot now. <laughs> so, in 1880, it was my actual. Yeah. <laughs> 1880, with a, with, a, with, with a single horse and a, and a buggy, leaving, North Bridgeton uh -huh. to get to Freiburg. It was an overnight, and people stayed oh, at wow. Walker Farm. Did you ever see, ever see oh, where Walker wow. Farm is? At? That was often a place they took in borders. So that was 1880. Oh, wow. That was 1880. Yeah. So if it was slaying weather, yeah, it was probably faster. <coughs> so yeah, it was a significant um, amount of time. And um, the diary of Phoebe Beach, she talks about going in during this is during the 1860s. She talks about going to Freiburg. She's going for at least a week. She's not just going to run over there to the Harvest Hills thrift shop and pick something up and come home. Uh, it's, a, it's a great deal of effort um, to get over there, so they're going to stay there and they're going to visit all of their family while they're there. So it's so were people in Bridgeton sending their kids to the academy in Freiburg, or they were pretty much founded pretty close to one another because... They sent people, um, some of them went to Gorham. Um, so there was a, I think it was a Gorham Seminary, normal school, normal school, but there was also a seminary, as I recall, because I think one of the pearly sons or grandsons went there, because there's a letter that he's written back about some anti-slavery stuff. But they would board. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you're, you're going to get your kids, you're going to send them off to school, and it's going to be a while before you see them again. It'll be the end of the term. The group is born and went to Freiburg, Canada. Ruth Porter went to Freiburg Academy, um, as did a number of luminaries uh, like Joseph Fessenden, who's Joseph Fessenden is um, the first pastor of the South Bridgeton Church. He's uh, kind of one of the lead characters in the second book in the series um, about abolition and underground railroad. <coughs> so yeah, Freiburg was like the important school, which is why Bridgeton had to have one. Because you don't want to just send your kids all the way over there. You don't want to send them to Gorham. You don't want to send them to Portland. Some of the pearly uh, grandkids went to Portland. So it was very important that we have a, an academy here. And then it became, after that, it became important that not only do we have an academy, but that we have a high school. Because a lot of people couldn't afford to go to the academy, uh, to Bridgeton or Freiburg, because you had to pay. So Bridgeton High School came along. And um, I don't know if you know where the... Uh, Christian Historical Society is the old fire station and the new fire station uh, kind of up on Methodist Hill. That's where the Bridgeton High School was and, and they set it up there like on this this hill. So from every viewpoint of the town you're looking up at 
this high school. It's like this shining building sitting up there. It's like an aspirational thing that everybody mm -hmm. wanted to go to high school. That was a big thing. Yeah. I know you guys are all excited about high school. There's young, young folks here. You can't wait to go. But they placed a, a great deal of value yeah. on education. And thank goodness, because they could all read and write. Um, so I have something to talk about. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be all oral tradition. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. When you spell kissy, was yep. it K I S S I? Actually, it may be. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it's I, because yeah. there's a double I, and those are the ones in Kenya. Okay. So oh. K I S S I is Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Okay. I just oh. wanted to clarify that. So it's getting bad. See, do we love librarians or what? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. In Rufus Porter Museum, isn't there a picture of one of the doctors and his family? Um, is, okay, Portrait. and we have a copy of probably the same picture at Naramis. Okay, so that is Dr. Farnsworth's mm -hmm. son and his family. Okay. And Dr. Farnsworth's son's wife is related to, <laughs> oh no, He's, they're related to the Pearlies. Um, and I'm trying to remember what the, the young Dr. Farnsworth is a cousin to the Pearly children. I think that's the way it is, Ina Pearly's children. Uh, but there's like a double relationship there, because the wife is related and the husband's. Rufus again, Porter was a Pearly. And Rufus Porter, um, mother was a Pearly. There's a whole, <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Rufus Porter and his genealogy recently, because I was doing a talk for senior college last week, and Rufus Porter is related to so many of those early families in so many different ways that it's really hard to say, oh yes, he's the, the second cousin of the third uncle of the, it's very confusing. I actually had to put it into software in order to keep track of it all because it's, it's very convoluted. Because there was like this small group of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, this cousin married that cousin. Um, my husband is actually related to the Putnam family. So we all are cousins. We just don't know where yet. But probably you're my cousin from New Jersey because they went to Kentucky. And, you know. I, have, I have New Jersey people too. Okay. <laughs> the, Ward, the Ward family from New Jersey. Okay. All right. So in the end, we are all cousins. So my. Uh, New Jersey family came from that Massachusetts Bay Colony folks. They moved down to eastern New Jersey, and then a branch of them moved over to western New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. And then when I came up here, I ended up realizing that we're probably related, but I don't know how yet. I'll find it someday. I'll have another one of those Eureka moments. Anybody else I can help with anything or not help or make something up? <laughs> so studying history is really cool for those of you who might want to take it up as a hobby. Uh, it will lead you down some fascinating trails and um, one of the great things about it is that I get to take field trips and it's really cool. <laughs> so yes ma'am. Actually I have a question. I'm looking at the pearly cabin picture. So when did they have windows? I'm thinking about bugs. Well, um, an air. One of the things that they would have had to do is they would have had to bring the windows from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So they probably came up by ship, and then they would have been brought up the lakes in order to get here. So they did have windows, and it was fairly early. I'm not sure exactly when these windows went in, but it could be about the time that he built it. Yes, sir? Seems to me in reading your book that you said he brought some of the windows up in his uh, saddlebags. I said that in, in my book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when people pay attention. And it, it very, I may have come across something that, that talked about that. Yes, I do remember that now because it was like a big deal. Huh. Because I don't think that uh, Benjamin Freeman and everybody got into shipping all that furniture and stuff that much by the time that, I mean, Enoch was up really early. Yeah. And he had his wife come and he had to make it look presentable. Yeah. So, should go back. 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, no, honey, no. And you, when you think about that, what they were leaving to come here for, 
Mrs. Burley yeah. was not living in a one-room cabin in Massachusetts. She was living in a really nice, substantial uh, home because it was the, they were like the fifth generation. So people have been here for a long time, and they had worked very hard to create what they used to have in England. And um, so she came from like a really nice house to living in this little shack um, and working very, very hard. I mean, she was she was not um, sitting around knitting all day, although that would have been part of her job. She was working very hard, so they had to clear everything. They had to clear the fields before they could plant them. Once they planted them, then at some point they were going to have to uh, harvest them. And the grasshoppers were terrible. Um, this <laughs> Enoch mentions that a lot in his letters, how bad the grasshoppers are. So I don't know if you've ever seen a locust storm, but it's frightening. I mean, there's just frightening. And they're everywhere. Like, they're everywhere. You can't walk across the ground without stepping on 30 of them. It's nasty. I say that for the young people, because I know you like gross out stuff. Uh, yeah, so, but the, the window glass would have been something they had to bring up, and they had to bring leather. And he talks about that a lot in his letters, about, to his brother, saying, can you send us some hides or some, um, leather aprons, because they needed those for work, and they, they had no way to do it here. So Enoch Pearly being one of those um, engineering, entrepreneurial kind of guys, figured out how to tan leather. And if you ever, here's a good thing for you to Google. How do you tan leather? Ooh, nasty, 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 nasty. Yes. Stinky, and uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Magic Lantern, it's called the, the pub is called the Tannery <coughs> Pub, and that's because there was a huge tannery on that spot. Um, it was part of the reason why the building had to be torn down that, that was there, because it was settling, and the reason it was settling was because it was all bark underneath, bark from the tannery. So as that settled and rotted, the building kind of went like this. It was not good. Um, so anyway, a very stinky, stinky industry. And, and do you know what they did with the uh, waste products from the tannery? <laughs> right in the old Stevens Brook. There you go. So it took a long time for that to clear up, but it's doing much better now. Even since when I was a kid, it's doing better. So It's all in Long Lake now. It's in Long Lake. You know, it's making its way. It'll be in the ocean before long. Nope. And then, you know, we don't have to worry about it anymore because we don't use the ocean. So. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else got a question? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank um, you. We are here. <laughs> we're here again next week when we're going to talk about the abolition movement and the Underground Railroad in this area. And just as a sneak peek. There were two Underground Railroad trails that came up on either side of Sebago Lake, and they joined, guess where? Right in Bridgeton area. So, thank you very much.